And our speaker this evening is Professor Katie Halsey, who will speak on book borrowing in Scotland from 1750 to 1830. Katie is Professor of 18th Century Literature at the University of Stirling and co director of the Centre for 18th Century Studies. The publications include books on Jane Austen, William Shakespeare, and the history of reading, as well as numerous articles and book chapters. She's currently principal investigator of the AHRC funded research project, Books and Borrowing 1750 to 1830, and analysis of Scottish borrowers' registers, which seeks to establish which books were real circulating in Scotland in the period, and thus to change some existing narratives about the Scottish Enlightenment and the Wiki movement we now call Romanticism. Her talk will be about the Books and Borrowing Research Project, and she will discuss some of its early research findings with a particular focus on the libraries and wider book culture of George and Edinburgh. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, Robert. And um, thank you, uh, Heather and Maury Rutherford, who isn't here, for inviting me to speak tonight. It's and thank you all for coming. It's great to be here to talk about this research project, which has been going now for three years and a little bit, and which will finish in December. I was hoping to be able to man the slides myself, but thankfully Kit Baston, who's one of the research fellows on the project, is here, so she's going to be uh, doing that for me. So forgive me if there's a bit of move the slide on, please. Um, part of tonight's uh, talk is going to be a demonstration of some of our online resources. So again, this may not go quite as smoothly as I might hope, but Kit is going to be a wonderful helper, I know. So hopefully you'll bear with us um, as we deal with the technology. Um, so since we're in Edinburgh, I thought, as Robert would say, I should focus on Edinburgh and the libraries. But before I do that, I just want to introduce the wider project um, and some of the things we've been doing for the past few years, for those who don't already know about it. And sincere apologies, Robert, Elizabeth, Jill, Kit, and um, James, who already know some of the things that we're doing, but hopefully it won't be too boring for me. I hope to say some new things. Kit, could you put the main project slide up, please? <clears throat> So this is the website of the project. If anybody wants to have a look at it later on, uh, feel free to play around. If I get very boring during the course of this talk and you've got a phone for a laptop, uh, you're welcome to have a look at our website when we're talking. So I have to say the project's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. It's a joint initiative between the Universities of Glasgow and Stirling. Okay, give me the slides on, please. <clears throat> I've been incredibly lucky for the past three years to work with a wonderful team on this project. Their names are all on the slide, and I want to stress at the very beginning of this talk that what I am presenting is collective work. Much of the research has been done by other members of the project team, and I don't want to take credit to their work without acknowledging them. Um, so I, I'm not going to read everybody out, but I should say that um, a couple of people on that slide, Alex Deans and Jerry McKeever, have moved on to other jobs. Jerry now works at the University of Edinburgh and Alex at the University of Glasgow, but their work has nonetheless been extremely important to the project. We've also had the support of a very large number of art libraries and their archivists and librarians, two of whom, Elizabeth and Robert, are here today. Um, and the project wouldn't have been possible without that wonderful support either. So I'd like to thank all of our libraries as well. Yeah, could you move this up? Um, so just a few moments to talk about what we've been trying to achieve over the past years. There's a very simple goal at the heart of this project, which is to establish which books were really circulating in Scotland in our period. Now that's a simple goal, but the answers are not simple and the methods are not particularly simple or easy either. But to that end, what we've done is we've transcribed, well first digitised, and then transcribed more than 150,000 apps of book borrowing. And by that, I mean quite simply what I say, when someone goes to a library and borrows a volume of a particular work, that is an act of book borrowing. And we've transcribed these from the borrowers registers of 18 Scottish libraries. These libraries were chosen to be as representative as possible within the constraints of the extant evidence. I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. We have in our database then institutional libraries, subscription libraries, a private library, a circulating library, a school library, a miners library, a couple of religious libraries, and Scotland's first free lending library in a library library. <laughs> so these are our libraries. 
Um, and I hope just having a look at those and I put the type of library next to them gives you a sense of their scale and scope. Some of them are very small libraries, some of them are enormous, some of them have very extensive borrowing records, some of them do just have one ledger. In Vanessa Kirk Sessions, I just have one page, for example. Mm -hmm. So we've done our best to kind of um, account for that in the ways that we've organised the data, but they, we are really confined to libraries that still have borrowing registers or borrowing registers from our period that have survived. Um, and again, I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. Could I have the next slide, please? So we've tried as far as is possible to represent the whole of Scotland. Our northernmost library is Orkney Library in Orkney Isles, and our southernmost is Wigton, way down on the southernmost peninsula in Met. Um, and the others kind of plotted around the country. So Aberdeen, uh, five in Edinburgh, some in Glasgow, some in the central belt. Um, we're poorly represented in the kind of northwest and, and the far west, I guess, simply because there is no surviving evidence that we have found there. But other than that, I think we do cover the whole country pretty well. All this being said, it is really important to note the limitations of the extant archival record. But I'm just going to pause here to show you what the extant archival record looks like. I'm sure some people have seen borrowing records, others maybe not. So Kit, could we go on to the next slide, please? So the first of these is a, a page from the Orkney Library Borrowers Record from 1824. It's a fairly standard example, I'd say, in tabular format, um, which is quite helpful in organising the data. It records on the left-hand side the member's name, um, then the title of the book, the date issued, and the date returned, and then some notes or remarks. Now, many of our libraries don't record the return date, but pretty much all of them record the borrowing date or an approximation of the borrowing date. Some registers have slightly less or more information. Some include, for example, a borrowing address, and in wonderful cases, sometimes in a petri, a borrower's occupation, which is really exciting. But that's the kind of information and the kind of record that we're working with. And I'm just going to show you a couple more examples. Okay, could you move on to the next slide, please? So <laughs> this is the um, Chambers Circulating Library Register, which is held at the National Library of Scotland. And we were very fortunate to be granted permission by the Chambers family to digitise this and include it in our project. Um, so this, <laughs> I wanted to include this to show, I suppose, the difficulty of the task that our research fellows and the project team have been engaged in, in some cases. So this one shows the borrowings of Miss Wright of 37 Queen Street. Now that's fairly easy to make out at the top. Down the side, you can see her subscription rates. She paid um, uh, uh, when she paid and how much she paid. Um, and then it may or may not be plausible for some of you to make out some of those titles, but they're recorded very laconically, usually just with one word. It's just usually the name of a novel, sometimes novels that don't exist anymore or exist only in unique copies. Um, it might be plausible, I think, to make out marriage up there, but Susan Ferrier's marriage, next to a novel called High Life, um, and so on. But Kit Bogatmir and Alex Dean, who I mentioned earlier, have done an amazing job of transcribing this register and it's now all in our database more or less. Um, could you move on with this? <laughs> now, this is another really fun example. This is an example from Western Kirk Library's borrowers register, which they call the calendar. And what makes this one a particular challenge, as you can see, is that the titles of the work are not recorded or they're recorded only by number. So um, this again was the work of Alex Deans to match up the numbers in the borrowing register with a contemporary catalogue, which would say, for example, 201 where I read first table. So that was a lot of work <laughs> to do that. Uh, and Alex again did a pretty amazing job there. I cannot tell you off the top of my head though, Alex probably could what those numbers represent, but I do know Mrs. Bell at the top there is borrowing Edgeworth and Burn quite substantially in that top um, line there. Um, and then I think that's the last of the registers I'm showing you just at the moment. Um, yeah. Okay, so just back to the kind of limitations of that archival record then. Borrowing records survive in greater numbers than perhaps you might think. And actually Scotland's really unusually rich in this survival. We've got more borrowing records, I think, in Scotland than in any other nation I know of, which is kind of interesting, I think. For all sorts of reasons. Anyway, we know that there were, people would take at least 300 libraries 
in Scotland in that period, 1750 to 1830. Um, I'm taking that data from Keith Manley's brilliant survey of Scottish libraries. But borrowing records remain in existence for our period, but only about 25 of those 300. And we've only been able to cover 18 because of the limits of AHRC funding in three years and the number of people we could employ for the money. Even of those 18, we haven't been able to be completely comprehensive in our coverage, where we have very large runs of records, and this is the case for the university libraries and for the advocates library. Um, we've had to choose particular decades to cover, so we have had to be selective. So just to give you full disclosure, a sense of the scale of what we have not done, at the beginning of the project, we estimated that we'd be covering about half of the borrowing acts that we knew about from borrowers registered in Scotland. But that is the nature of this kind of project. As you go along, you find more and more material and more registers start coming out of the woodwork. And um, we discovered new registers in places that we already knew had registers, but they have more of them and so on and so forth. So we now think that there's probably over half a million borrowing acts in extant borrowing registers, of which we've transcribed 150,000. So that gives you a sense of what we haven't been able to do. Nonetheless, I don't want to be too negative about this. This is still a far greater um, set of evidence, I think, about book borrowing, not just in Scotland, but anywhere in Britain, than has ever existed before. So we think we've done okay. We're pretty proud of what we've done within the constraints imposed on us by the amount of funding and the time we've had. It's perhaps also worth saying that when we haven't been able to fully transcribe the borrowers' registers, they are all still digitised and they're going to be available online through our um, digital resource that I'll show you in a moment. So anybody who wants to do more transcribing those registers will be able to do that. Um, and people who are really interested in, for example, a particular library that we haven't transcribed everything from can go back to the digitised version of the original registers as well. So people who are really interested in this will be able to do that work. Um, and we but that's going to be useful for scholars across the world, really, who wouldn't necessarily be able to get to the original um, archives to look at those things. And it's certainly a, re a large enough body of evidence, I think, to throw up some really interesting and significant facts that have made me think very differently about the books and ideas that we normally think of as influential in the period. For example, I think it's probable that most people in literary studies departments, and probably the wider public too, would we'll think that in the period from about 1780 to 1830, that is the Romantic period, the most important writers of the literary movement we now call Romanticism would be Wordsworth and Coleridge, William Blake, Percy Shelley, John Keats, and Lord Byron. Indeed, they are really important. Their poetry is extraordinary and it's brilliant. However, not one single book by any of these writers appears at all in our top 10 most popular book holdings. And it hardly sneak into our top 100. Um, could you put our top 10 book holdings, which is the next slide on, please? And I think this will probably be a surprise to most of you. Um, so instead of finding Keats, Byron, Shelley, Wordsworth, and so on, uh, or indeed in the earlier period, um, instead of finding um, I don't know, Richardson Fielding. We do find a bit of them, but, you know, they're not in the top 10 either. Um, in the number one slot, what we have is The World Display, a collection of voyages and travels put together by Oliver Goldsmith, Christopher Smart and Samuel Johnson. Now, I think this is our number one, um, mainly because of its enormous popularity at the Royal High School of Edinburgh, which is one of our, our partner libraries. If you take the Royal High School out, it moves down substantially. But nevertheless, it's there. It was clearly influencing the minds of generations of all high school schoolboys. It's clearly much more important than any of us had ever realised or known. Um, our research fellow, Maxine Brown and Miss Campbell, has done a lot of work on the Royal High School. I'm very indebted to her research on it. But just to give you a sense of what the world displayed is, it's a 20-volume compendium of travel writing marketed specifically to children, published by John Newbery and introduced, as I said, by Samuel Johnson. <laughs> um, it's been described by Barbara Schaff in her handbook of British travel writing as a plainly commercial uh, publication sorry. it was designed to set. The 20 volumes encompass a collection of famous travel narratives structured within a history of navigation. Now, it isn't the only collection of travel writing that's really popular in the Royal High School and across our data set, but it was by far the most popular at the Royal High School. Um, the second of our most boring book holdings is, and I think I've got a picture of him on the next slide, actually, Kit. 
Uh, no, I haven't. Sorry, that's a picture of Thomas Vandeleur, who's a Royal High School schoolboy bearing the work displayed. Um, uh, yeah, but at number two, then, of our most borrowed recordings is the French historian Charles Bolin's Ancient History, a large multi volume work on ancient Greece and Rome. Now, this one's interesting because it's popular across all our libraries, almost without exception. And it was really clearly borrowed extensively in the whole of Scotland. Um, you're going to see at number 10, there's another of Roland's works, his ancient history of the Egyptians, Carthaginians, etc. They are two separate works. Uh, Roland worked, um, wrote two other kind of important works as well, a treatise on education and um, a Roman history. Now, they appear too in our records, but they're not in the, the top 10. Now, Roland's kind of an interesting figure, actually. He, he was rector of the University of Paris, but then he gets sacked from that position because he had religious views that were unpopular. And that's when he took the writing. Now, the ancient history is, I would say, sometimes inaccurate in its, sort of its presentation of historical facts. Um, but nonetheless, again, clearly really influential. Um, and probably we think on university cur curricula across Scotland, but also read in subscription libraries at, um, at other lending libraries that borrow from private libraries as well. Um, okay, the periodical Blackwood Edinburgh magazine, here we are in Edinburgh, home of Blackwood, uh, takes the number three slot. And again, it's popular across all 18 of our libraries. And this is interesting for all sorts of reasons, but this goes from 18, sorry, 1750 all the way to 1830. And Blackwood magazine is only starts to be published in 1812. So you can see, actually, that's quite a significant finding, given that there's the whole, what is it, 70 years? I'm not very good at maths. 60, 63 years before that, when it couldn't possibly have been borrowed. So that really gives us a sense of the enormous popularity of Blackwood. Um, I think probably most of you know enough of that Blackwood, but I'll just run through what it was. So it was a magazine in Methelony, um, founded by the publisher William Blackwood. Um, it's kind of, it was founded as a rival to the Edinburgh Review. Um, it's a kind of more Tory version, I suppose, uh, or a Tory rival to the Edinburgh Review, which was a Whig publication. Um, and it was very ferocious and combative. Um, its reviews really kind of took a line that was argumentative. Um, There's a lot of satire in Blackwoods. Um, but it's extremely popular. So it gained a very large, large audience. And people knew this already. This is not a new research finding. It confirms something that people have been saying for a while, which is that, you know, from about 1810, Blackwood completely starts to dominate the periodical market. But interestingly, I think it dominates the market more broadly. In fact, um, it dominates the bookscape, perhaps, in ways that we haven't entirely appreciated. Um, at number four, we've got Captain Cook's Voyages by Captain James Cook, of course, this describes Cook's voyages in the Pacific and his various adventures there. And I think it's fairly obvious why that was popular, probably. But at number five, Voyages and Travels by William Maver is again a work that I myself had heard nothing about. I knew nothing about it. So Maver was a Scottish clergyman and he wrote across a huge variety of different genres. He wrote about natural history. He edited the Geographical Magazine. He wrote conduct books, um, he wrote educational treatises, but also kind of digests of Latin grammars and works for young people. And again, they were very popular in the Royal High School, less popular across our other libraries, but um, still read a lot. Now, William Maver, a name to conjure with. We um, <laughs> really knew nothing about him before, but there he is, not once, but twice in our top 10 list there. Um, and then in seventh place, we've got Buffon's Natural History, so Buffon, another Frenchman. Um, and of course, this work is a really, I guess, compendious um, description of natural history in about 20 volumes, have I got that right? Yes. Um, and it's got wonderful illustrations. I think I've got a picture of the illustration. I may have, I may need to skip a couple of slides to get, keep going. Yeah, okay. So that's the frontispiece of the Inner Peppy Library copy of Buffon with um, an illustration. I'd be interested to know if people know what that animal is. Anyone? Yeah. It is a hippopotamus, yes. Um, uh, but I, I'm not convinced the illustrator has actually seen a hippopotamus. <laughs> Um, it's a beautifully illustrated work, I suppose, and I think that partly accounts for its popularity. But it covers a huge variety of, of um, uh, explanations, I suppose, of natural phenomena, which people were clearly interested in. And this was, in fact, the single most popular work in a pair free library, even though it only comes in at number six or seven, sorry, seven, uh, on more general list. Uh, could we carry on? We should come back to the slide for book. Yeah. 
Um, and number eight, we've got the Edinburgh Encyclopedia, which I don't think I need to explain much. But again, notice the focus on Edinburgh in this in our Scottish libraries. Um, um, and it's very popular at Westerkirk, the Miners Library, where they're obviously using it for all sorts of um, reasons to do, I suppose, with self-education. And then finally, um, work by William May, we've already talked about Maver and um, the ancient history of the Egyptians by Roland. So to Roland, to Maver. There are some caveats to be made here, and I want to make them. The first is that we haven't completely finished entering data, so these figures are provisional and they are subject to change. The second is that multi-volume works do feature much more heavily in the figures than they might if we decided to count in a different way. Because our system counts acts of borrowing, rather than kind of completing all acts of borrowing into one, um, this means that multi-volume works appear more than they might otherwise in our system. <laughs> For example, if a person borrows all 12 volumes of Buffon that, on separate occasions, that's 12 acts of borrowing, as opposed to one borrowing of Buffon, even though they're 12 volumes of the same. So that is a caveat, and we explain it in the we will explain it in the digital results. Um, so multi-volume works appear more frequently. Um, nonetheless, I think these findings are suggestive and interesting, they are to me anyway. So instead of the lyrical ballads, often called the work that begins the Romantic movement, we're getting the ancient history, Blackford's magazine, and Voyager's work, various works of voyages and travels as the most influential work in the period. The total absence of novels, poetry, and plays in this list might give us some cause for thought. Certainly in literary studies departments, we're used to thinking of the 18th century as the period of the rise of the novel, after the end of the famous book of that um, title. But our data on the contrary support Mark Powsey's recent assertion that history is in fact the dominant genre of the 18th century, followed very closely by voyages and travels. Could we move on to the next slide? Okay, okay if we cut the cake a slightly different way and look for our 10 most popular authors instead of the most, 10 most popular single title, we get the, the following results. So once again, Charles Mollat, um, heading up the list. Um, but then we get William Robertson. Um, Robertson will be familiar to everyone, I'm sure, who was a part of Edinburgh Society principal of the university, uh, a star of the Scottish Enlightenment, author of some of the most popular histories of the period, including his history of America, his history of Charles V, which are extremely popular. Uh, then we've got David Hume, who needs no introduction to anybody. Um, it's not always been philosophy, actually, more often it's a history going out. But again, people know that we're confirming something. At number four, Sir Walter Scott, not at all a surprise, I think. Um, but again, this is for these departments. I really want to teach Scott, <laughs> well, um, but they should because there he is. Um, and actually, if you if we were to do a search that took up only from say 1800 to 1830, the quarter of the last third of our database, Scott would be right there, number one, top, front and foremost, along with the Edinburgh magazine. Um, but then we've got some more familiar names, Oliver Goldsmith, Fielding, Addison, but Mabel's still there at number six, um, Smollett, and finally James Hook. So here we start to see a bit more of that prevalence of the novel that I was saying we didn't see at all in the most popular titles. But again, no sign of that big bit of romanticism, no teach Shelley Byron, etc. Um, so it's kind of, I think it's sort of suggestive and interesting, and that's all I'm prepared to say at this point. I want to do a bit more work to find out exactly what's happening, um, to, to kind of really tease out these results. Um, we can now search our results in all sorts of different ways. And when you do, it throws up different things. There are substantial changes, for example, we found in the period pre and post 1800, when, as I said, the novel starts to really come into um, its own from about 1800 onwards with the bursting of Scott onto the literary marketplace in 1814. Um, and we would see various different things if we took out particular libraries or particular types of libraries and so on and so forth. But very soon you'll be able to do that for yourselves, should you want to do so. Um, and uh, the book that I'm going to be writing with my co-investigator, Matt Fenster, is going to talk a lot about all of these sort of different things. But I suppose for me today, the headline finding that I'd want to report, I suppose, for me what our data shows perhaps above all is that things really happen much later than we think they do. Um, so we like to think of historical moments such as 1798 and the publication of the Lyrical Ballad as really important and influential. But what we forget is the necessary time lag 
to allow a kind of trickle down effect. It takes a while for books to get into libraries in the first place. It takes a while for them to circulate. And perhaps even longer for ideas contained in those books to become major. So the very idea of a cultural movement and indeed a cultural moment becomes something rather different, much slower than we've had sometimes thought. So the cultural moment of romanticism, for example, is actually a construction of the later 19th century. England, when everybody really is reading words, and they're reading Shelley and they're reading Keats. So, you know, were I to be talking about 1860, that would be the romantic moment in a sort of weird way, even though it's a Victorian period. In their own moment, when these writers were producing extraordinary and wonderful poetry, everyone wasn't reading them. They were reading the land, they were reading Mavis, they were reading Robert. Byron and Scott are actually an exception to this rule. We see them flying off the shelves the moment they come into um, libraries. <clears throat> but nobody wants to cheat. God wants to teach Byron now, but for a very few people. So that's what's most useful about our data, is that, that it allows us for the first time to drill down what Richard Altick called the mass reading public. So rather than, know, rather than knowing what rich people who could afford to buy their own books and to buy the latest publications as soon as they were published as a matter of course, we know, we're now able to take a look at what those who are much more limited in financial resources could do and who are dependent on the kinds of library collections that we have in our database. And so doing, I think we've got a rather better idea about what the German critic Wolfgang Issa called the horizon of expectations of readers in the period would have been. So if we know what they were actually reading, then we know what they might have expected of books. <clears throat> to me, if we really want to understand the minds of people in the past, if we want to understand the ideas that are really influential and circulating, this feels like a slightly more solid way of doing it, I think, than just sort of seeing the diaries of elite readers or uh, reading reviews from periodicals, which of course give a very skewed view sometimes. Anyway, as I said, when our digital resource is fully live, you won't have to take the work with you. can search our data yourselves and you can come and talk your rubbish and that would be fine. But I do want to give you just a quick preview of the digital resource and just some of the ways in which you can search the data and how we've built it. And I'm going to ask Kit then to click out of the slideshow so you can click and submit to the website. Um, and we'll get, okay, so one of the things I like is on this day. Um, so this changes every day. Um, so here we are, Richard Crook, um, in 1790, borrowing two volumes of philosophical and political history of the settlements and trades of the, yeah, of the Europeans. On that side, I don't think that tells us much, it's just kind of nice that we like to have. Um, but we're going to go into the explore libraries function. This is a huge site, incidentally, it takes a long time. I'm not going to demonstrate it, I'm just going to demonstrate selected parts of it. So if you zoom out of the, of the map, it, um, don't zoom all the way out, but that it just gives you a sense of where our libraries are. Um, right up at the top, there's Auckland as well. And if you click it, don't do this, but if you click into any one of those book icons, it will take you into that particular library. Now, the really sharp sighted amongst you and those good at mathematics will note that there are not 18 little books. That is because five of our libraries are in Edinburgh, three of them are in Glasgow. So um, if you go closer in, you do get a separate one for each library. Um, but could we go down to the chart at the bottom first? Hit now. Um, keep going. Um, now, this extremely intimidating looking chart at the bottom is our attempt at full disclosure of where we have a lot of data and where we don't have a lot of data. Um, so the bars represent number of borrowing acts and the colours represent where those borrowing acts take place, so in which library. And if you hover over any one of them, so if you hover over yellow kit, uh, it takes away all the others and that shows you where our data are from St Andrews University Library. So you can see where we've got lots and where we haven't got lots. And that of course is really important when you're doing um, statistical analysis across the whole data set. Um, okay, can we go back up kit and click into the advocates library? Now, I chose the Advocates Library because I knew Kit was going to be here and she's done the bulk of the work, in fact, all the work, I think, um, on transcribing the records of the Advocates Library. But I also know that Robert is interested in the Advocates Library. So hopefully, Robert, this will be of interest to you. So and or for each of our libraries, we have a front page like this, which allows you to visit their own website and to visit the modern catalog if one exists. Um, we also have a representation of where it is. And if you go down, there's a chart that shows you, again, where the data is for that particular library, just in another format. So you can see that there are years where we have nothing um, in the Advocates Library because we haven't been able to transcribe the whole thing. And then 
across the rest of it, you can see we've got quite a lot. Okay, and then if you go down a bit more kit, um, we haven't finished, as you can see, explanation of the chart will go here. Uh, it will one day. Um, this is definitely in a state of undress, so please forgive us for this kind of peep behind the curtain. But anyway, it gives you other sources that might be useful were you to be someone who wanted to do more intense and detailed work on the Advocates Library, um, both primary sources and secondary sources. So this is all Kit's uh, brilliant work that you're seeing. Okay, Kit, can we click into uh, the registers um, of the Advocates? <clears throat> So as you can see, the Advocates Library have 54 registers and they're pretty big. How many pages in each one would you say here? So 600 well, pages and some of them, is that right? It's listed on the Oh yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. plus. Yeah. yeah, so obviously if it says zero books, zero borrowers, it simply means we haven't transcribed them. Um, feel free to open any register kit. The FR 262A is its manuscript number from the National Library, so you can find it if you need to. Um, and the Advocates is actually quite nice because it's printed, so it's a lot easier to see, um, but it's crossed out. So uh, whenever um, a book was returned, it's crossed out. Uh, choose a page, get anyone you want. And OK, so this, I think, is probably the most impressive part of our entire system. On the left hand side, you have the original digitized version of the resource. On the right hand side, you have our transcriptions and that information from that resource. So you can see, for example, um, who the borrower is immediately. You can see what the book holding is. Um, and you can see when it was borrowed, when it was returned. You can see any extraneous detail, like a fine pledged in case of late return. Um, and all of our system is based on clickable links. So you could, if you were interested, follow Borrow Mr. William Binning Wallyford through the system to see everything that he borrowed. You could also click on, for example, yes, well done, Kit. <laughs> you could, for example, hit, um, click on Catherine McCauley to see all of the books that we have of Catherine McCauley's in our system. You can, and who borrowed them and when. You can click on Macaulay's History of England and see all the borrowings of that work. I won't belabor the point. <clears throat> on the left hand side, what we have are some things to further filter. So, this is what we're seeing here is Binnings, Binnings his History, History of England, Catherine Macaulay's History of England. So, if you're interested to see um, borrowings from any one of the other libraries from which Macaulay's History went out, you can filter by ticking. The library so say you're interested in okay so this has gone out of the advocates that's a subscription institutional subscription library maybe i'm only interested in subscription libraries i'll take the other subscription libraries um you can i'm, I'm not sure how useful borrower title is going to be we may suppress that eventually but suppose you're interested in all the professors who borrow macaulay's history you can click into that and see them so do it okay <laughs> if you're interested in a kind of socio-economic borrower search you can do that by seeing how many people in the category of university students were reading Macaulay's History of England. You could see how many doctors or sheriffs or Presbyterians succeeded. That's not precisely what you should, but anyway, you could, you could, we need to change that thinking. Um, okay, so if you go down a little bit more, um, it's in two formats, did not know that. Um, so you can, I can't imagine why you'd be interested, but if you want to know who's borrowing the Octavo version or the Porto version, the data's there, so you could find out about it should you want to. Um, and the ESTC numbers of the different editions of Macaulay's history that are in our database are there as well. So <laughs> again, if you're somebody who really knows all ESTC numbers of my art, you can search by those as well. Okay, Kit, can we go back up to the top? All right, and can we go back to the homepage? Um, oh, yeah, and then you can say, so, no, that's all right, go on, yeah, I meant actually. So you can also search all the books that are in the tabs like across the top, all the books that are in the Advocates Library, and you can search, if you're interested in finding a particular book in our data set, you can do it that way. You can search for borrowers, um, but I'm just going to show you the facts and figures section, because that's actually, I think, the coolest and most exciting one. And then I'm going to stop showing this resource, I promise, in part of one more search. 
Okay. So for each of our libraries, we have a kind of summary, which tells you about the number of books there were, how many of them were borrowed, how many borrowing events, et cetera, et cetera. It also, and this is where I was getting my top 10 list across the data set from, from our main facts and figures page, gives you the most popular books in that particular library. So remember, this is the Advocates Library. So the most popular um, books in the Advocates Library. Fascinating. The Cabinet de Fay at number two. So that's a collection of fairy stories being borrowed by Edinburgh Advocates. Number two, who knows? The numbers don't lie. The Scots Magazine, the Monthly Review, the Philosophical Transactions, all these periodicals. Of course, there are law books going out as well, collection of state trials, imaginary voyages. Uh, and then finally, another law book. But it's interesting, isn't it, to see that the Advocates Library clearly isn't just functioning as what you might call a working library for lawyers. It's very much also um, a lending library as well. Um, the advocates actually, in all our other libraries that have both genders of borrower, um, you would be able to see the most popular authors and books by male borrowers, female borrowers, and borrowers whose gender is unclear as well. But because the advocates only has men, um, it's only male borrowers. So if we go down, you can see the most popular authors. Keep going down, Kip. Um, and here we go, most popular most prolific borrowers, so the people who are borrowing the most um, from the library. Down we go again. Borrow occupations. Yeah, again, maybe I didn't actually choose the right library here because most of them are um, advocates. <laughs> but uh, for all our libraries, there's a breakdown by borrower occupation. And I was looking at the Inapepri and Leighton libraries just recently, and these charts are much more colourful because they've got lots of different people, glovers, weavers, dyers, all of those sorts of um, occupations as well as the main category here of the law. Okay, right. I think that's probably enough. Could we go into, oh, sorry, yes, and this is um, about the breakdown of borrower, of borrower occupations just represented differently by um, across the whole period as opposed to just a kind of general part of it. Um, okay, Kit, could we just go into the advanced search quickly? Let me go back. Back again, again. There's a lot of data in our system, that's why it's slightly slow. Actually, just if you just in the bar, if you just delete oh, and just get from just from library onwards here. Sorry to do that. what goes to solar without the libraries. Okay, maybe so just quickly go into advanced search. Okay, so the way I was just showing you is more of a kind of browsing way of looking at things. But if you've got targeted searches that you want to do, this is the way to do them. So I'm a Jane Austen scholar, to begin with, at, at heart. So we're going to do a search for Jane Austen across all our libraries, just to show that you can do it. Um, again, Jane Austen, probably the best known author of the Romantic period today. Would that be a fair thing to say? Not actually a huge number of borrowings of Jane Austen. <laughs> I think it's, yeah, 50 something borrowings um, across all of our libraries, as opposed to you know, some thousands of them. Mm. So for Jane Austen, not super popular in her time. Again, we knew this, but it's good to have the extra information here. Um, and then Kit, if we could just go back to the main search page um, and uh, just yeah, get rid of Jane Austen. And could we just tick our Edinburgh libraries? So what I wanted to show you here is it's possible just to search one library, but it's also possible to search across four or five different libraries. Could you find Wigton or the one up at the very north of Scotland? That's on the contrast. Yes, yeah, the advocates. Yeah, that's the Wigton. We could just do Wigton. And could we look for one that was Lenny Byrne, Scotsman? In Wigton, yes, yeah, so he does go out of Wigton actually. There you go. 
Yeah, not circulating hugely, but Wigton's a fairly small library. Um, I and think they've got, got they've got him, and they've got him in that really beautiful edition by Curry, I think. Um, yeah. So yeah, Ashley Burns is one of the few poets who does circulate more than once or twice. Actually. So yes, there you go. Um, and to some female borrowers as well, which I always like to see Mrs. Blair back up there. And, uh, there she is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll probably just stop um, doing the showing you the dev side for now. Can I? How much time have I got left? 15 minutes, perfect. Right, can I show you the Chambers Library map? So this, I've talked a little bit about Chambers Library already. Chambers is our only circulating library, so circulating libraries being commercial propositions run out usually out of booksellers' shops as opposed to subscription libraries or institutional libraries and the other kind of library. Um, and Chambers Circulating Libraries Register is incredibly rare. There are only two circulating library re registers that we know of across the whole of Britain and Chambers is one of them. So we were extremely fortunate to be allowed to digitize it and put it up here. And the lovely thing about Chambers, you saw the page, um, is it gives you the borrower's um, home address, which meant that we were able to do a bit of plotting of where borrowers came from on a lovely historic map. So Alex Deans and our digital humanities research officer, Brian Aitken and Chris Fleet at the National Library of Scotland, um, work together on, on this to create what I think is quite a nice interactive resource. So, <laughs> yes, sorry about the gender stereotyping, blue is for men, pink is for women um, in the gender categorization here. You can actually zoom out of the map, but we'll just stay in this kind of nice new town part of it because the majority of Chambers borrowers were from the new town and we think probably fairly well to do as well. So you can filter by gender, um, you can filter by their occupation, and if you click on that, you can see um, the sort of variety of occupations that we have um, and the majority of people um, are unknown but you can see um, a few occupations recorded there that we've managed to add in if we filter by subscription type so new books a subscription to be able to borrow new books cost more than a subscription to be able to borrow all books. So this is kind of an interesting way of seeing how much people were prepared to pay to borrow from Chambers. Um, and you can see that actually the majority of people, I think, are taking the new book subscription because they're really keen to get their hands on the newest possible books. And it is really interesting, actually, Chambers, more than any one of our other libraries, really goes for novelty. So they're, they're getting books and they're and taking them out as soon as they possibly can. And then you can also filter by number of borrowings to see who um, uh, is you, you know your most active borrower and I think this might be quite a useful teaching tool actually if you had a kind of bright undergraduate class or a master's class and you wanted to kind of encourage them to do some work on this reading and reception element of the communication circuit you could get them to kind of look at some borrowers and think think through how much they're borrowing the kinds of things they're borrowing. So, so if you click on any one of these, why don't we click on one of the 70 plus borrowers kit so a dark red person. Okay so someone living in York Place Who's it going to be? Mr. Adam Wilson at 11 York Place. Um, you can see that he's a writer to the signet, I suppose. Um, he's got a new book subscription and he's, he actually, yeah, that's nearly a year that he's got the subscription period for and he does he borrows 78 books in that time. And then you can actually click into the pages and see what those books are. So really this is a kind of a, a way, a, a different way into the data. I think the development side I was just showing you is probably going to be useful and interesting for scholars, but this is a different way in. I, I hope it's a slightly more fun way into some of the, the data that we've been collected, collecting. Uh, anything else I should say about the Chambers map? I think that's really it. So if we go out of the Chambers map and into the online exhibition, so this was another way that we hoped to bring the kinds of research we've been doing to a wider audience. And um, this was a collaboration between Elizabeth being over there, Bianca Packham in your digital department, I'm not sure precisely what the department's called, but exhibition, and Kit who did the majority of the work on this and the rest of our project team. And we called it Library Lives, Hidden Histories of Reading in Georgia and Edinburgh. And it's an online exhibition, so we learned a lot doing this exhibition, um, partly that most of us aren't very good at writing in short 
<laughs> and that we want to tell people everything that we want, and that's really not very useful. Um, you can explore this at your leisure, and I would really encourage you to do so because it's got some really beautiful images. But I thought, given that we're in Edinburgh and this is the Edinburgh Bibliographical Society, why not Edinburgh's reading lines as something that you might like to see um, tonight? So, can you click into Edinburgh reading lives? Um, and here, what we were trying to do is highlight some of the stuff that I've just been telling you about the popularity of periodicals um, and our research findings about periodicals, but again, in a fairly, um, we hope, accessible way. So we give a kind of introduction to periodicals and try to explain um, why they're, like the, the history of periodicals, I suppose, in Edinburgh, and why um, they might have been popular. So that's the Edinburgh Review rather than Blackwood, but a bit of description of it. Um, it famously attacks the Lake Poets and Byron. Um, and this one, uh, if you go down to the caption kit, um, so this is, uh, this is a page of Blackwoods that I was talking about before. Um, and it's a kind of, uh, so it's like a, an allegory. So Blackwoods were pretending that they were an ancient Chaldean manuscript. Um, and you can see that one of the reasons, if you go back up again, um, they've worked at this out, they've worked the satire and the allegory out, and they've explained like um, that the ancient Chaldean magazine is actually Blackwood, and Blackwood is the person that they're talking about, and so on and so forth. So it's a really nice example of the ways in which we just actually interact with periodicals, um, and kind of the sort of playfulness of that interaction between readers and reviewers in Blackwood. So that's um, kind of a, a really nice example of that. And if we go down a bit, and talk through the whole thing. You've seen this before, that we're explaining um, periodicals go out to circulating libraries and Chambers had a subscription to a lot of periodicals and they wouldn't have that subscription if they weren't, if it wasn't profitable. So uh, on we go. <laughs> uh, then we get Walter Scott, who is just everywhere across our database. He's an author, he's a reader, he's, um, he's got a finger in all sorts of pies, he's a publisher, he's involved in the quarterly review, he writes reviews, he is reviewed by reviewers, all of that. So Walter Scott had to be somewhere. Um, so if we move on down, I think that's the, that's the last picture, isn't it? And then it can go backwards and forwards beyond the online reader. So we're really, really glad of the online exhibition. And um, I hope I can encourage people to have another look at it without me talking you through it and you can relax and enjoy it at your leisure. Um, but I think that's probably enough from me. So I wanted just to invite questions, um, ask if you want to have another kind of play with um, the resource, we can probably get that back up. But uh, yeah, so questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can we have a pause to get um, uh, Professor Halsey, uh, it wonderfully rich. I'm speaking from the point of view of having had, as an accountant, but on treasurer for the Poetry Library uh, it's for 30 years. My bit of job was easy, but the hard job was for the librarian because every year to get your forward support, it was absolutely vital that they had full detail on the borrowings. And first, I have to say, they were extremely um, in the low figures. And when the government said, I need got more readership. Yeah. Anyway, um, after I retired from it, I took opportunity to be, um, to get away from the Edinburgh side altogether. I joined the Byron Society, which got me to Greece. Lots. But I met one very interesting stop abroad. Uh, and his name was William Sinclair. And he did the book that you'd be well known uh, called um, Reading It. And the Buying Public of the Victorian Era. And my only question to you is when you were applying for money to get your grants, a vital thing, and uh, what were your models and citations in order to justify your yeah. project? And did you read? Oh, yes. Because he got in. We were hugely into the archives of the um, the Murrays down in London before they eventually got bought for 33 million into our back door here. Um, so was there any use of in the framing of yes. in the that that helped you? Indeed there is, yes. In fact, um, on our website there are a series of blogs that lamented death actually. Um, 
Yes, so he was enormously influential in what we were doing. So his research findings are, he uses what's called a systems approach. So he looks at publishing records, as you say, he looks at records of readership, including what he calls anecdotal records, which is where people say, I was reading Byron, etc. Um, and he's very influenced by sales figures. Now he looked at library records to some extent, and the work he's done on library records was very good, but I think he simply didn't know actually about some of the sets of records that we have. So yeah, in our framing, we said that we wanted to use um, his work and the work of other people like Paul Kaufman, who've done work on various other libraries and so on. And we wanted to build on that work um, in a digitized format because <laughs> amazing though some of that work was, it depended really on spreadsheets. And there's only so much you can do with a spreadsheet. Whereas if you can bring everything together in an interactive digital resource like ours and put things into conversation with each other. So you can put Selkirk Library in conversation with Haddington Library in conversation with the Advocates Library. You can do things that he simply couldn't do. So Paul Kaufman could do what you couldn't do. Um, but yes, I hope we've acknowledged him sufficiently. He's in several of our blogs and... Um, mm -hmm. Intellectual challenge of it is this. Um, 15 years ago, we actually had to let go and put him as a librarian. He needed to upgrade his job at that time for the only thing of bringing up new jobs. It didn't exist in the room. It's called meta family. And we lost him, they never got back. But we realized we're into a new terrain now. No. And I have to say, I'm very thankful we don't go as far as the Victorian period because um, once you go beyond about 1830, I'll cut off this. Um, just the proliferation of print in the Victorian period makes the job impossible. And of course, more borrowers were just to survive because it's near to time. And, and, and. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah I, I wouldn't be a Victorianist for all the tea in China. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's not surprising the difference between the number of non best health at Jane Austen and what's the world of life. If people have Jane Austen in their shelf at home, not going to go to a library to uh, get that book, and they're not going to borrow a uh, two books or erotica, even a, a Bible, and we're serious Bible scholars from a, from a library. Yes, it's definitely true, I think, that the books that you can't afford to buy for yourself are ones that you'll borrow from a library. And I think, but I think there's a really important difference between types of libraries there, actually. So, for an awful lot of people, actually, Jane Austen's not affordable. So, you know, 21 shillings for three volumes of Jane Austen isn't really affordable for anybody below the gentry or aristocracy in our period. So there's that vast middle rank of people and people in the labouring classes who are not going to be able to buy Jane Austen and put her on their shelves. Now, the majority of the advocates probably could buy a copy of Jane Austen if they want to, and they probably could buy a copy of the cabinet they say, but they don't. Um, so Books are more expensive than we think in the period is, I suppose, the first important thing to say to that. The second is, yes, I agree with you. It is the big, expensive, multi-volume works that circulate a lot from libraries. And what we wanted to do in the book, which I haven't really talked about at all, is to do a bit of matching up of things like sales records against the borrowing data. Um, I think the other reason probably that poetry doesn't circulate as much from our libraries is that poetry is more affordable. And also that it's in periodical of the reviews. So you've really got to want to commit to buying a collected Wordsworth, but you can read Wordsworth poems in other formats and from around the place. So there's lots of these sorts of questions that are there around the edges of what we're doing, that when we need to interpret um, those sorts of questions, we will be doing more of that. Um, but I still think, even with all of those sorts of things in play, and of course, Buffy read from the library isn't the only thing you read, you may be borrowing stuff from your friends, you may be buying it, you may be kind of picking it up at you know, booksellers and not really reading the whole thing. So there are all of those things going around what's happening in a library. But I still think those kinds of things are valuable to know about, the kinds of things that people are borrowing from libraries, because for that vast majority of people who can't afford a book, that's where they're getting the bulk of their reading. I noticed that you mentioned the the number of encyclopedia is one of the 10 most popular. And well, that was probably between 20 and 30 pounds. And I've got a volume in, said in my bedroom, 18 volumes, gorgeous. Yes. 
but it's surprising that that got into your list for really, you think, or perhaps just can you think of any reason because it is a voluminous work. I think it's probably because it's a voluminous work. Well, and were people actually paying to, to borrow it? Then? Um, yeah, Westerkirk. So it's really, really popular at Westerkirk. Um, and I mean, it's popular across the libraries, but most, it's mostly popular at Westerkirk. Um, and yeah, the subscription at Westerkirk isn't so I think they just really wanted knowledge that was in the encyclopedia. And of course, Westerkirk's got this weird thing that you can only go there once a month for moon, and that's when you want to borrow it. <laughs> um, so presumably there's some kind of car sharing or carriage sharing that allows people to a certain number of books and get them home. So, I mean, yes, I've always wanted about that actually, because I kind of think if you're a miner kind of walking across the hills at Westerk, and for those who haven't been, it's incredibly remote and it's very hilly. Um, mm. And you're walking across the hills of Paul, presumably in the rain, Scotland after all. Um, and you're carrying these books, you've really got the one book, haven't you? There's, there's no kind of, oh, I'm just going to take it home and leave it on the shelf and not read it. So, yeah. Um, and then, what, why they borrow those huge books? It must be something to do with. I've got a mum. I work from A3. I've seen a big What the position reading would actually read it in the little library? No, I don't think so. That's not, that's not what the evidence suggests. Jeff, mm -hmm. they are actually taking it away at the full moon. Yeah. Can't share. Anyway, I think it is one of the best encyclopedias, actually. That's why I. Yeah. For a copy, it's very thorough. It was Dave Sir David Brewster, you know, was the editor on it. And Telford was the case. I've got um, a couple of questions from online, if that's okay. We've got time. Um, Stephen Rawls asks, how precise are the sources about marrying up specific editions with specific borrowing apps? Yes. Um, ESTC has been mentioned. Yes, it really specific. So all of our borrowing apps are by edition rather than anything else. So Eventually, there will also be a higher level, which we haven't implemented yet, of the work. So the work will be every edition of that particular work. But at the moment, what I am showing you is borrowing of a specific edition, which has been matched either to the ESTC or if it's a post-1800 um, title to something else, Library of Congress, um, if we can, um, British, Library. British Library, obviously, um, sometimes Oxford or Cambridge, if they're unique copies, you know. So an edition, and sometimes even a specific holding where we can. Perfect, thank you. Um, and Enid McLeod asks, is the plan to expand the research to more libraries into a later period of time? <laughs> Have we got world enough and time? Yeah. Um, yes, we are applying for more money to do more. Um, I don't think we want to go forward into the future, that is the Victorian period. For the reasons I've articulated, I just think there's too much material. But what I really would like to get all of the data that we know about from the period in, yes. But it's, I mean, it's so frustrating because you have a great idea and you do what I think is a good job. Um, but funding bodies don't want to fund you to do the same thing again. They want to fund you to do something completely different. So we're having to think of slightly different ways to ask for money. But yes, the will is there. <laughs> Whether the, the money is, is there or not, it's not really up to me anymore. Then, very briefly, I was chairman of the Birmingham Old Library, founded by rather a bit, a, a, an important export from Scotland, Joseph Priestley, mm -hmm. in, and, and other from the so-called um, Lunar Society in the later 18th century. And there are early catalogues. The library, sadly, is still existent, but um, huge quantities of its better books, including Sun Pictures of Scotland, um, were sold off. Mm. For financial reasons. Um, but looking at your top 10 there, it was self improvement. Yeah, a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, whereas the Birmingham Library, which was a subscription but circulating library as well, um, my sense of it yes. was that the, the, they had these great books in which people looked at in the library itself. I think the books that were borrowed were for. Uh, amusement and entertainment, mm -hmm. even from that, that earlier period. Um, yeah. So it would be interesting to know if anybody uh, has uh, done a similar approach mm -hmm. to yours. I'd be fascinated if they know. Yeah. 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 Y
Um, I, the person who would, if anyone has, has marked heresy down at Liverpool, um, who has done, who's compiling a database of subscription, of British subscription libraries and North American subscription libraries. I think the Birmingham Library will be in that project. Um, so he'd be the person who... Well, even in my day, there was an organisation of subscription libraries. So the Portico in Manchester, the Newcastle lived and built actually wonderfully lively, mm -hmm. lively library today, s serving not the grandees of Newcastle, but yeah. the ordinary people of Newcastle with modern book which, you know, are, are, are readable. And the Leeds Library as well, I think, that has a similar... Yes, I think that was in the organisation. I never... Yeah, yeah. 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 Miles come in for all this. Um, he's, he's a bit late. Yeah. Yeah. I forget when I mm -hmm. first got pushing. Yeah, so he's too late for a while. Terrible. Sorry, but we have to try things to the close, but obviously you can speak to Katie afterwards. But can we please thank her again just now? Thank you.